The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Hello, hello, and welcome. All right, everyone, this is Chad Warburg. He's the senior network manager here by the Virginia Community College. He's doing open source education and Yeah, I only put the knots on my truth just to get you here. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. All right, well, thank you all for coming out. It's an awesome turnout. I really appreciate it. Um, so, away we go. Ooh, who are you? Are you a professor? Anybody professors? I know I have one back there. Uh, longer than some of you have been born, probably. Um, cool. And the rest of you will just have a vested interest in education? Library staff, rock on. Okay, good. Not the first librarian I've had in my presentation, so. Um, awesome, well, I just wanted to see who you were because I can cater this presentation to anyone, but I kind of thought who I knew would be here. But who am I? Well, that nice gentleman told you, but I'll tell you here. I, I am a senior network engineer at a community college. I've been working in education eight years now, nine years, something like that. I, I started out at K-12. I was here at the inaugural Linux Fest. I did a talk. This is like a follow-up talk to that. Um, which there will be some not so nice truths to some of the stuff that I implemented, but um, you also may unfortunately know me from a little podcast called The Linux Basement. It's still around. It, I don't do any new episodes, but there's lots of Drupal up on that. If you're ever learning Drupal, uh, you may come across my website. And we'll come back to all those savings that I flashed up there and did not talk about. Don't worry. We'll come back to that. All right. I like to walk around, but I have to hit the button, so it kind of sucks, so we'll see what happens here. I am here because I believe in education. That's probably why you're here, too. Um, you know, we all educate ourselves on a constant basis. If you don't, it's terribly disappointing, but I am sure you because you are here at a conference that is about Linux. You educate yourselves all the time. That's why we're here, right? I'm we believe our system is broken. All right, so I love education. Educational system in America is an absolute shambles. There are reasons for this. It's fiscally broke. This is the federal budget. No. Can I see that okay? Oh, yeah. Testing. 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 120. Testing. 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 Trending, right? So, so obviously we're not in 2016 yet. So these numbers trend. Um, it's actually, if you just look at same for five years. So that's cool. Down a little bit, but billion dollars net education. Always, by the way. Interesting enough, I just, you know, there's a lot of cool numbers here, but just to point out, almost a trillion defense. Totally cool. We, we, we love. What's that? This is true. Um, oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm completely biased. I'm, oh, no, that's totally cool. I am too, so we're good. Um, yeah, these are totally different. Uh, for instance, in Virginia, where I am, in K-12, it's a county-run system. Here in North Carolina, it's a state-run system, which is really weird. Now, we still get state money, of course, but central governance over the schools. Very, very... <laughs> Has problems. 
OK, so some interesting because I don't want to get killed anymore. That guy. So pedagogically, it's a broken pedagogy. Okay, I am in IT, but I love to study pedagogy. You know, the of how you actually get someone to learn something. All right. Um, so this is a problem. Last year, I think you were one of the professors back there, who you guys came and you were like asking questions not about not about how to get Linux into the classroom. You were asking like how do we get students interested in the freaking class. Um, that's a, that's a pedagogy problem, okay? It's not actually a technology problem, but it is part of the overall. It's still the problem. Um, this is a great book, Death and Life. Uh, excuse me, the uh, Death and Life of the Great American. In respect of the federal education program for 30 some. If interest in, uh, in why mentally there are problems with the school system. Oh, I wish I could just hit enter. OK. Um, cool thing, she said, uh, education is the key to developing human capital. We all know this. I'm preaching to the choir, right? Uh, it will affect not only our economy, but also our civic and cultural life. Unfortunately, in America, this is part of the problem. I mean, we, we know right now there are problems in America. And we're not fixing it in the foundation. We're throwing money at the foundation of our society is based in education. If you are not educating your young people, everything else falls apart down the road. Unfortunately, we have a problem with that. Very interesting thing she said. Um, don't worry, I will actually get a little geeky later. It does happen. Uh, she was at an international conference there. Um, that. Uh, uh, Sorry, geeks. Technology, nothing today. Technology is a cat to education. I have to have technology for a good education. I'm sorry. It's the truth. The only thing that ever, ever is good, ever creates better education is getting curriculum and drilling information. In school. I mean, if you, another good book is um, Work Hard, Play Nice. And it's all about how the only successful schools in America right now are charter schools. And it's very interesting what they do in these charter schools. And it's completely against the democratic system that we built around education. But these kids put on uniforms every day and they go to school and they go for longer hours. And they are disciplined immediately when something goes wrong in the classroom. And these kids are coming out of, I'm sorry. Discipline? Discipline, right? What? what? Actually, disciplining our children? There's a funny comic online. Uh, I'm getting way off. I, I rat a lot, so this will be fun. Uh, the, uh, there's a. F <laughs> right, right. We just, yeah, well, that, that'll fix. All right, right. Um, the, there's a funny comic online uh, a few months ago, and it had 1950s, and there was the parents yelling at the student and the teacher yelling at the student for doing something wrong, and then it cut to 2012, and it was the parents yelling at the teacher for something the student did wrong, which, if you're in education, really kind of hits home. Funny, not funny. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, very interesting stuff here. These are the key points in education. Now, I will get into the technology side, but I felt it was important to, to say up here, you know, I'm an, I've been in IT for 15 years now, but I don't actually think technology fixes the problem. I love open source. Open source philosophy can be part of the fix to the problem, and we'll get into that, okay. Hoorah. So as I said before, um, I think you can all see that. Yeah, it came up pretty good. Uh, yeah, China, China, China. One, one, um, that's interesting. Uh, Singapore, kicking ass, look at them. Good job, Singapore. Where's the United States? Oh, actually, they didn't have enough space on this graphic, so we actually had to put the number down here, 17th in the world for reading. This is back 2009, by the way, the new stats aren't out yet. Uh, 31st for math, nice, nice. 
and 23 for science. Um, what's that? Um, no. <laughs> right, 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 right. We are, um, this is not the way a first world country is supposed to work. Uh, yeah, so we have problems. Um, this is, unfortunately, this is why some of those students you get in class, they're struggling with math, let alone learning Java. Uh, but uh, anyway, we won't get too much into that. But you know, It's not that bad. This is a little doom and gloom, I apologize. What can I tell you? Well, it'll get happier, maybe. Socially broken. Uh, yes, yes, we are socially broken. That's what we were just talking about. Education is the next best thing to a record deal. That's it, people. What's better than education? Well, go get yourself signed and get a contract. Um, this is kind of, this is a funny graphic that I pulled from Seth Godin, another good author. I recommend all of his books. If you ever get to see him talk, he's talked at uh, Educause this past year. Educause is awesome if you ever get to go. Um, it is not all open source. It's, it's IT in higher ed conference, huge conference. Um, he spoke wonderful, wonderful talk about how the world is, if you want a real good job now, mediocre is no longer the norm. Now that sounds harsh, right? But back in our father's days, you know, you could have a resume and a college degree and walk in and get a job and work there for 30 years. Now you have to be spectacular. I am not just a director of IT at a college. I also have a YouTube channel. You can follow me on Twitter. I am all over the place. I'm doing a talk itself. You can't be mediocre anymore to get a great job. Interesting concept. Anyway, highly recommend Seth Godin reading. This is one of the cool graphics I pulled from him. And we move on. All right, and why am I here? I don't know why I'm here, okay. Uh, yes, so what did you actually come to hear about? Technology, open source? All right, by the way, this is Prezi. That's the first question I always get when I open the Q&A. This software that I'm presenting with is Prezi, it's awesome. All right, um, and it's proprietary, so you can all throw tomatoes at me or whatever. Uh, all right, so open source equals education. Uh, my point is, and, and this, it can cut off a little bit there, but uh, my point in this is everything we use, right in your pocket right now, has some type of open source, Linux kernel, BSD, something on it. Open source was created in the educational realm. Everything was. Name an open source project. Anybody? Don't mess with me. Pick a good one. Firefox is a good one. Um, Drupal's one of my favorites. Drupal down here, this guy. I talk, I do a lot of, I do a lot of Drupal. I know, yeah, it's cool. Um, I do a lot of Drupal work. I'll talk about that more, but Drupal, what happened, how, why was Drupal created? Why was Linux created? We've, someone was at college, found a need, filled it. Uh, all the open source software that we know and love today, aside from Chromium, although I can make an argument that started at a, uh, <laughs> that started at an education place too, um, was built around a need usually based in education. I mean, open source is part of the education paradigm. Open source was not open source when it started in education. Of course, that was coined back in the late 90s. But the whole philosophy is built on education. There's some interesting graphics. That's actually from my presentation that I did last time. Does anybody ever use Tomcat anymore? Anybody use Tomcat? Yeah? Oh, yeah, well, you're a Java junkie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. Zimbra? I haven't used Zimbra in ages. I used to run the heck out of some Zimbra email servers, though. Uh, yeah, cool stuff. All right. Django's still around, right? But have they gotten up to the next version of Python yet? I don't know. I don't know. Like Python 3? I know that was a problem. All right. So around the philosophy, I will get to the geek stuff, I promise. But around the philosophy that open source was built in education, there is now a huge movement towards open courseware, open classes. You can learn whatever you want now online for free. Now, nobody's going to give you credits for it. But who really cares about that anyway, right? We're IT guys, right? Um, so <laughs> we're just going for the certs anyway. No, if you want to learn about biology tomorrow, go online and go to these sites. And it's fantastic. Do you want to learn about computer science? Go there. Carnegie Mellon has a fantastic site. 
Berkeley's site is awesome. Talk about an aggregation of wonderful, wonderful videos that you can just watch. A uh, little plug here. Actually, I'll get to it. I almost got ahead of myself. And of course, the in my opinion, the real founder and push towards this was MIT OpenCourseWay. They've been online the longest with a very, very robust, sophisticated system to take courses if you're not in education. I mean, if you're not, if you're not interested in the credits, you just take the course. It's all up there. It's fantastic stuff, OK? So well, I'm, I'm, I, won't, I won't get into too much of that. But cool stuff, just some resources, right? So now this is in my plug. Um, the success of open source, that's actually in my office at work uh, on one of my bookshelves. The success of open source is one of my favorite books of all time. The reason I even found out about the book is because there was this great course at Berkeley, and I can't find it online anymore. So you're all going to hate me for even talking about it, because now you're going to search it, and you're not going to find it. It was this fantastic course, a 10-week course. I started listening to it. I went through uh, LectureFox. So LectureFox is an aggregation of, uh, of open courseware that you can just search, find the course you want, and it'll, it, it's like an aggregator. Um, and it, it was the success of open source. The uh, Weber is the author. He actually works at Berkeley now. He did it when this course came out. <laughs> and this course was so awesome. They had the guys, I, no, I, I'm bad with names, the guys who uh, founded Apache came in and talked one week. And then they had um, uh, the guy who, who's the, um, what's that huge online world, not Minecraft, before Minecraft, it's the virtual world. Uh, Second Life. They had the guy from Second Life come on and talk about the open source process and their business. Every week, they had the rock stars of open source show up and do these fantastic talks. And, and you could read the book and follow along with the course. So forget about the course, because you're not confining. I don't know. I, I, if you do, please let me know, because I search and search. I wanted to make sure I put a link up, and I couldn't find it anymore. It's so disappointing. It's not up online anymore. But that book, it goes to the history of Linux. It talks about um, all, all, the, all the educational uh, basis of open source software. Fantastic book. There's my plug. Um, and whoops. a little, little interest, just, just one quote from the book, and I really like this. Uh, I, lo I love meritocracy you know, paradigms. And speaking on the meritocracy of open source, he writes, by creating the right to fork code, the open source process transfers a very important source of power from the leader to the followers. OK, that privi the privilege that comes with leadership then depends on continuous renewal of a contingent grant from the community. That looks like a complicated sentence. But that is a powerful, powerful idea. If only government worked that way, right? It is meritocracy. Government should work this way. To actually grant the power to the community. Wouldn't it be great if a classroom worked that way? OK? When you actually have, give power to your community, they get more involved. It's very powerful stuff. Anyway, uh, there we go. Onward. Education. Oh, you saw it. Did anybody see that? Anybody see the, the colors? Eh? Education is Microsoft driven in the United States. So we all, a lot of us work in perhaps schools or are vest have vested interest in education. Mm. I can tell you I worked for K-12, and, and now I work for a huge college system. Um, the Virginia Community College System has the largest Oracle installation in the world, the largest Blackboard installation in the world. Um, and so it has a lot to do with Northern Virginia and how the whole system aggregates everything to a central location. But I mean, Microsoft, we have licenses at a yin-yang. If you go to school in Virginia, you can get a copy of Windows 7 for $5. I mean, that's it, right? The first hit's for free. That's it. The drug dealers have been doing a long time. Microsoft knows. Google's the same way. It's funny, I was in a, uh, I was in a talk. Um, and sorry, I know Google, I know they're giving money to the conference and all that. I apologize. To, I'm not talking bad. They are evil. Um, but I was just at a, a, a Google. I would say it's a talk. It was more like a sales pitch for Google Apps and EDU. I've moved, I moved to K-12, so I'll talk about it in a little bit, but I moved to K-12 system than I was over to Google Apps, and I'm moving to college now over to Google Apps. Um, they fully admitted. <laughs> they said, a question from the audience, um, why is it free? Why is it free for education? And the woman just grinned. First, it's for free. She didn't say that. I mean, she said because, she said because 
well, we're giving that to people in education. So they go out in the business world, and then they're entrepreneurs, and they already use our product, and they want the product, and then they go to the business side, and they have to pay $50 per user. Not a lot of money, but wow. I mean, that's, Google admits it. First hits for free, okay? Same thing. Microsoft is everywhere. Um, unfortunately, this presentation will not have a lot on how to get Linux on the desktop in education. And that's why. I have this, you know, it's very, very hard. Now, unless you're running an engineering school or something like that, then you have a real need immediately for Linux on the desktop. But when you're getting it so cheap in the educational institution, it's very hard to make the argument for that kind of uh, open source driven movement on the desktop. And people know I'm a freedom hater anyway, so this is fine with me. Uh, is it? Depends on where you are. Like Virginia Tech, all Linux all over the computer. But I know a lot of computer science departments are just teaching Java and doing it on Windows. And right, right, yeah. Um, which is unfortunate. I'm, I'm a big, I'm getting a little rat hole again here, but I'm a big proponent of not just learning Linux, not just learning Windows. Uh, in my world, I need to know everything. And I feel like it's important to be, it's cool, man. I, I'm all about promoting, I'm here to promote open source. But I don't think you should be limited to one thing. I said this last time, I'll say it again. These guys have heard it a hundred times. They're probably gonna hate me for telling the story again. But I went to, uh, I go to SANS every year. I go to SANS at Virginia Tech. Um, uh, and I learn different cool hacking crap and it's awesome, right? And they always, it's always a Linux based class. SANS classes are great for that. And Ed Scotus, some of you may know him, hacker extraordinaire, uh, said, it was like, this was like seven years ago to me. He said, he just said, he was talking about, you know, hacking on the Windows command line and things like that. And he said, but why limit yourself to the mediocrity that is Windows? And I was sitting there trying to get by on Linux, um, and, and that hit me. I'm like, you're right. I need, how can I call myself an IT professional and not know more than one box thing? Now, that's me. I'm in IT. So the normal person, do they need to know cross-platform? I would argue yes. Some people don't. If my father uses Linux and he doesn't even know it, okay? My father, all his stuff is web-based. I said, Dad, look, I'm not gonna spend $120 for a Windows license. I'm not gonna steal it. Let me just put this on there and see if he can get by. I've not heard from him in like two and a half years. Like, he's totally cool, man. Everything's web-based, right? Um, so, you know, it, it, it works for some people. Uh, it's expensive, right? Well, we just kind of talked about that. Is it expensive? We think Windows is expensive, but in the education arena, it is not, which is part of the problem with adoption. Uh, so there you go. Where is the success? Underserved community. This is what I'm big on. I live in the second poorest county in Virginia. When we first moved there over a decade ago, my wife had a job for community development uh, program, and they were actually putting plumbing in houses. These people did not have plumbing in their houses. This is the early thousands. Uh, there are still dirt floors. 60% of the population is in poverty. We have 14% unemployment, which is actually almost normal now, which is unfortunate. And I like serving underserved communities. I think it's important. There is a very, very big problem in America with poverty-driven ignorance, okay? And it's not going away, it's getting worse. The middle class is shrinking. It all falls into this, this, uh, this education paradigm. So this is something I always sell in these talks, opendisc.org slash education. So back in K-12, when I was in K-12, if a student wanted to do their homework in their computer class, we did not make them buy a Microsoft license. Instead, they could go to the front desk at the school, and we had a stack of the opendisc.org slash education DVDs. They could take it home, pop it in. This is an wind, all Windows programs, OK? Everything on this disk, all open source Windows programs. It has uh, um, LibreOffice on it. It has just a tons of stuff. Here's a list. Absolutely fantastic tool. Why not hand this out to underserved communities? DVDs literally cost a dime a dozen now. Literally. Um, 
why, why not, I mean, if, if my, my kind of joke the last time I did a, a similar talk to this is, um, you know, Johnny, it's not a joke, uh, Johnny can't do his homework simply because mom and dad can't afford windows? No, hand him a disc. Let him do it. Awesome stuff. So I don't work at K-12 anymore, and it's interesting what happened when I left. I'm going to talk about that. That's the not-so-nice truth that we'll get to. People have computers and also no operating No, they have windows. Everybody has windows, man. Come on. Well, that's what I'm saying. Oh, no, excuse me, it doesn't have office. That's what I'm saying. Um, like, uh, these kids are taking, um, uh, uh, you know, just even English now in high school requires you to write the papers and, and put them in on, on, a, on a word format. Um, you know, give them this and let them do it. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Thank you for uh, letting me clarify. Is it, it's not .org? Is it porn? Did I just send everybody a porn site? Nice. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yes, so underserved communities, it's really what ha dr drove me in K-12 uh, to do a lot of the stuff that I did, which I will talk about in a little bit. Developing nations! This is a crazy, crazy link. Um, if you go to Wikipedia and look up list of Linux adopters in government, I didn't know there was a list. I, I just started searching around, and this is pretty cool. Who knows how accurate it is? I mean, they said Rob Lowe was like one of the founders of Linux. I don't know. I'm kidding. Um, so, yeah, some, some, just some real cool, quick stuff here. Um, the White House. I, I, take, I take partial credit for the White House going on Drupal, but I'll talk to you about that afterwards if you want. Because um, <laughs> Anish Chopra was the, never mind. Okay, so uh, t in 2010, uh, the Philippines uh, filed an Ubuntu-powered national voting system. I think that's cool. I just think it's cool that in the Philippines when you vote, you're on Ubuntu. I just think that's freaking awesome. It's not education, but I thought I'd throw it on there. So here we go. Uh, Macedonia, uh, 180,000 Ubuntu-based classroom desktops. Right on. Uh, Brazil, 20,000 Linux desktops running in elementary and secondary public schools. Go Brazil. Brazil's an interesting uh, demographic when you look at how fast uh, Brazil and China and India are, how fast they're growing. And the cool thing about Brazil is they've always been open source friendly. Everything is driven by open source in Brazil. It's fantastic. I want to go there, but I don't speak Portuguese. Uh, and Russia announced in October 2007 that all its schools' computers will run on Linux, and the mafia is pushing that in. I'm only kidding. I don't, I don't know who is, uh, who's actually rolling that out. But yeah, go Russia. OK. And I think there were, there were some problems. I remember seeing follow-up. I think we've talked about this. I think there was some follow-up. Um, Article saying that that kind of fell apart in Russia, but hey, good good for them for trying. <laughs> I don't know. It's, what's that? Ma Microsoft claimed that Linux was communist, and whatever Microsoft says is <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's which is really interesting now because there's some interesting Linux um, tie-ins with Microsoft, particularly on patent front now, where it's almost like you almost might think that Microsoft now defends Linux very secretly. But anyway, if you want to get into conspiracy theories later, I can talk to you afterwards. Is um, it was. I would say. I would say Mac. I would say Mac is a bigger pusher than that. Yeah. Um, but they've been doing this for a long time, even before either was a real. Well, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But they're smart. I mean, it's smart. The first is for free. I mean, they, they knew that a, a long time ago. And it has been cheap in education for a very long time. It's been over a decade. When I started administrating Windows, I don't know, it's been a long time. It's been over a decade that it's been really, really cheap, um, which is, you know, whatever. You know, like I say, learn everything. If you, can get your, if you can get your cheap $5 Windows 7, then go ahead and get it. Don't, you know, whatever. Uh, money, money. Those first two things are all money driven. So, very interesting thing about where I work now, because it's a state institution, I mean, I mean, we're not completely rich, but I have a lot more money than when I was in K-12. In K-12, I drove a lot more open source adoption because of how little money we have. As much as we like to say open source and, and uh, uh, free software is cool and great, and you should just adopt it because you you like it and it's the good thing to do. The fact of the matter is most times open source is driven by money. Why? Free isn't beer. Okay. Uh, which is an important factor when you see some of the numbers I pull up in a few minutes here. We could argue that, but it's not worth it. Uh, progressive governments, I, I'm going to skip that. 
And there's my server room right there. So this is, this is the real success story. This is one of my server rooms. This is a real success story to me. Um, Linux as a success story is more that every single one of you has some kind of Linux kernel in your pocket right now. See these devices here that run my network? That blue code is actually shut off. These arrows are terrible. Like I got two small arrows and one big one. What happened there? I don't know. Um, uh, so that blue code is, a, is an interesting device. It's a packet shaper. It's one of the ways that I used to um, kill torrents and <laughs> downloading on the network. Kind of have to have it if you're in your education. Um, it's a BSD-based box, OK? Palo Alto Networks, OK? If you've ever administered a firewall before and you don't have 100 people to administer it, <laughs> Palo Alto Networks, I'm just saying I don't work for them. I just love this box so much. Linux-based device. Well, it's, it's, it's called a second generation fireball. Look into it. It's awesome. It's, does, it sniffs every single packet that goes through the network without any latency because they have this huge management back pain. Fantastic device. Um, you can run like TCP dump right off of it too. It's really cool. And wire sharking. Uh, it's the Cisco 3800. Anybody know that Cisco is actually based on all their, I, their iOSs are based on Linux? Yes, they are. And in fact, Cisco now, all this, they, now Cisco is like, well, I hate Cisco. I hate them with a passion. Sorry, Cisco people. Um, but I have to, like, I have to run this 3800. It's the supported device for our edge network. Um, and I've worked with Cisco for a long, long time. It's just one of those necessary evils, unfortunately. Uh, interestingly enough, Cisco now is in, like, the content market, man. They're going to rule the world, right? We will, we will cost you about... $170,000 more than Drupal and serve your content for you. And everything that they come out with is Linux based now. Everything. I mean, they just came out with the, uh, the, the CS phones, which flopped terrible. But that was an Android based video phone that Cisco rolled out. Cisco is <laughs> those people that make a lot of money off Linux and don't give anything back. Uh, and did I say that? Sorry. And uh, a couple other things here. And see, this is the success story for me. You know, here's, the, uh, here's our uh, Barracuda spam firewall runs Linux. Um, here's an old ASA. It's turned off. I've just never pulled it out of the rack. Cisco, Linux. Uh, there's the success to me. I feel like that, that all these devices that you don't even think about run this open source on the back end. It's amazing now. I mean, Linux runs the world. It's freaking awesome. It's just too bad it's not on more desktops, right? OK. So the Linux lurking, that's the Linux lurking beneath pitch. That's my, one of my taglines for my podcast. But, and small steps to open source. This is where I encourage people to take the small steps. It's not about taking someone's head and smashing it into a Linux laptop. You will use Linux. It's taking small pieces of software and saying, hey, did you know that you're already using Firefox? You know, Firefox has an interesting story behind it. It's a huge open source project that took over the browser space. And it's free to you. And the reason being is this is how the open source paradigm works. And people get interested in that. My boss, back when I worked in K-12, had no idea he was using all this open source software. So I started getting him into the dialogue of it. And he became interested. Now he runs Ubuntu at home. Uh, and it's been years now. We don't work together anymore. Uh, and, and unfortunately, he still calls me if there's a problem with it, but whatever. He's a good guy. All right, so here's some uh, interesting things that I implemented when I worked in K-12 and some of it in higher ed. Interesting thing about Drupal, and I won't, I mean, these guys know I can talk about 45 minutes for Drupal. How, how am I doing on time? We good? What do I have? Okay, cool, cool. All right, so I might have to speed through a little bit of this, but um, I just, we just did an RFP at the college for uh, completely redo our website. Our website's built on ASP.net. And uh, I hate, like, if you put something on IS, it's just like, hack me, please. Please hack me. You have no idea. Half the time I administer that stupid firewall is because people are trying to ha hack into IIS. I hate it. So fortunately, I wasn't there, obviously, when they built this website originally. Uh, I've been in my job for three years. Um, so it's, it's due for a refresh. And we put an RFP out. Now, for those of you who don't know what an RFP is, it's a request for a proposal. In a state institution, if it's over a certain dollar amount, you have to put a request for a proposal out. And anyone in the world can bid on it. And then you look them over. And you don't have to pick the cheapest one. 
but you have to have legitimate reasons as to why you picked that proposal, and then you go forward with the project, right? Freaking tedious, let me tell you. We got 32 responses to the RFP. They ranged from $7,000 to $230,000 to redo the website. We required in the proposal, which is the nice part about RFPs, that they use an open source platform. So we narrowed it down to five. Funny story, I'm running low on time, but I gotta tell the story anyway. Seven, seven, so seven, the $7,000, I'm like, $7,000, are you kidding me? And it was this uh, company out of India. I probably, I can't tell you too many deals, I'm definitely not gonna tell names. But um, <laughs> they had, a, they had a, a, an office in Reston, the proposal came out of Reston, but it was clearly a company from India. And uh, they had actually, beautiful, beautiful RFP, and we're like, $7,000, are you kidding me? They had actually built a mock website for us. And the, you know, the RFP was only out for 30 days. And they took some of the content, they put it on there, made it look nice, we're like, wow, these guys know what they're doing, $7,000, we're in. I, put it, I, uh, I send the RFP over to my boss, he opens it up on his outdated Windows box, and it got pwned. The RFP had a virus embedded in it. <laughs> and I reported it to uh, Sands, and I talked to, um, to Mike Poor, who was my instructor this past year, and he's like, he said, he said to me, it was actually, it wasn't embedded in the PDF that they sent, it was a link to that mock website, had a flash cross-site vulnerability, and my boss is, because my boss is, we don't, we don't touch my boss's computer, so it was out of date and got pwned. Dang, awesome, right? So anyway, we reported it, and obviously we didn't go with that RFP. Um, just a funny story. Did they get compromised? Did who get compromised? The, the, the folks who, uh, who replied to your RFP, did they get compromised? Or yes, so, you? So, so I don't know. But um, talking with, I mean, if anybody knows Mike Poor is like a rock star in the hacking community. Um, so I emailed him immediately. I'm like, what do I do with this? And he's like, oh, nice story. And, uh, and he said, um, chances are, we talked it out a little bit, chances are they got pwned, and the template that they were using, they un unknowingly were sending out these RFP. Now, I talked to a few other people who I will not name, who said, but it's, and the argument is made, $7,000 is an awfully low price for that RFP. No one came close to that. Um, the one we're going with is about $54,000, so that gives you an idea. And that, they're using an open source platform. They're gonna be using Drupal for us, okay? But it's still costing us $54,000 to redo our website. That's some money, huh? Interesting. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to move over thousands of pages of content to a new platform off of one and the other, so they're doing all the legwork, so that's what it costs to do business. Um, Fog, does everybody know what Fog is? Anybody here know what Fog is? I know you guys do, because I've preached many times. So Fog is really cool, right? So in IT, you clone computers, right? We, we all use Ghost, uh, Arceo, Ar 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 Arcos, no, shoot, what is that, not Arcos, Ar I don't know, there's a couple big, Acronis, thank you, it's been a while. Um, for a huge network, I run about 2,200 computers, costs around 30 grand to have cloning software if you purchase it through a proprietary vendor. Fog does all of that and more for free. It stands for free and open ghost, that they don't say that anymore because I think they got pinged on it. Um, it is absolutely fantastic stuff. You can schedule clones, you can do wake on LAN, all sorts of really cool stuff with Fog. I could, I could do an entire presentation on Fog. Um, obviously, I talk too much anyway, so we won't. Uh, virtualized the network now. Argument, I won't get in too much of this because we did go with VMware. It's proprietary software, but it, a, a, another Linux-based uh, uh, software, actually. Um, but virtualization, what's that? What is it? Oh, yeah, right. So there are plenty of ways you can do it, free and open source. That's why I put it up here. Um, I can give you a lot of arguments why I went to VMware, but. Uh, you know, what's interesting is once you get a virtualization platform, it's awesome running Linux on top of it, because you can just pump them suckers out. But uh, yeah, so it's another, another real big cost savings. So this was the huge one, there's a question mark. Um, this is what I talked about last time when I was here. Um, move the entire K-12 system completely off Microsoft Office and move to only OpenOffice and Google Apps. Successful implementation. Very painful, I mean, pitchfork and torches. You wanna 
take a teacher's office suite away, you better be ready with the bullet, uh, bulletproof vest. Um, but we did it, and, and it was successful, and everyone moved over to this. Uh, now, they weren't running Linux on a desktop. This was Windows-based. Um, but because of licensing fees for K-12, because they don't have that engine, because in Virginia, remember, I said it's all county-driven. So we, were buying, we weren't buying our license as a conglomerate, which I can do now working for the state, which makes it really cheap. So uh, this is a little bit of fuzzy math, but it was around $200,000 over about three years' time that we saved just through licensing and moving people over to this. Right, and handing out those disks at the, at, at the end, and then now it's compatible with what everybody else is running anyway, and nobody cares. Right, you would think. So here's a not so nice truth. Three years ago, I left my job at K-12 and went to move for higher ed, right, go me, woo! And they literally did not even smell me leaving the door before they started rolling out Windows. Um, it took about a year, new management came in. They don't run any of this stuff anymore. Fog is gone. There is no reason to get rid of fog. It's free, it works, but they didn't understand it. So they got rid of it. Now they're using a Microsoft, the fog, I don't even know what Microsoft uses it for cloning, but now they're using that, which costs them a fortune. I mean, I literally was not, I know this, but my kids go to the school district, my, my wife's a teacher at the school district, so I keep, and I know all the people that you know, used to work for me and stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Agreed, and, 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 this is, you know, and this is what I always say to that. When's the last time you called Microsoft because you had a problem with Word? No one's ever done it. They call the IT guy. You, have you called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have, but I don't recommend it. Right, don't call, yes, it's the worst thing you, I have talked to Microsoft. It was a directory system issue. But exactly, extraordinarily expensive and really frustrating is basically what that boils down to if you call Microsoft. Um, Absolutely, it's, it's hard, I, I hate hiring. I hate hiring. Um, no, I, I've not hired someone who's known Linux, ever. So they're just support, they have Microsoft support, so when they hire a new person, they only know Microsoft. You're absolutely right, that's why, that's why I got switched over. And they didn't understand what they, they didn't, that's the only thing they know. It's very much an ignorance thing, but you're right, it, support has, as, as part of it. Um, I understand why they. I understand why they switch back, and, and and we could we could talk about that all day, and I, I do think it's unfortunate, particularly for the underserved population. Now, it's, the teachers are the ones that were fussing. The students don't care. Students learn like that. Change, no problem. It's the teachers that really pitched a fit long enough, and the change out of administration, and so that's the unfortunate, not so nice truth of that. Um, I've always been. Like if, you're, if you're in security, if you're in IT and network management, you know, there's a, I could talk to you about a gazillion different tools to manage your network that are open source. It's fantastic. There's no reason to spend money on it. Um, they work, and, and there you go. Um, so I, I did want to mention, because I know some of you are educators, I did want to mention some cool stuff, you know, just other stuff that I use or have used over the years, you know. Um, Linux Terminal Server Projects, is that still going? Does anybody know? It is, is, yeah, okay, cool, cool. I haven't used it in a few years, but that's awesome. Serves the Linux desktop um, through a server. Um, yeah, here's some other cool stuff. Recently have done quite a bit with Snort. I'd be happy to geek out with someone about that later. Uh, yeah, you know, PF, I threw that for the like major geeks. Just, just yeah, right on, NMAP. Um, cool. Well, I need a lot of stuff in there, you know, whatever. All right. I was worried that I was going to go too short and going too long. That's awesome. And let's move on. The bloody aftermath. I just talked about it. Okay. Got a little ahead of myself. Putting it all together. We're closing it up here, friends. Get involved. That's actually my, my message, and I did an extraordinarily poor job communicating it to you, uh, which is fine. <laughs> Get involved. Be a voice. We know, as open source people, that being a member of a community can be one of the most fulfilling and important things you ever do in your life. You might not get paid for it, but you do get paid for it, all right? 
take that same philosophy and go out in your community and talk to educators. Talk to your fellow educators. Talk to your school boards. Go to LUGS. Go to conferences like this and scream. Because it's important. You are part of your community. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I know. It's important. See, it's important. Um, you are an important member of the community. Make sure that you are the voice that people go to. You know, I said I didn't hire, I've never hired someone that knows Linux. You want to know how many, many of my staff know Linux, though? Why? Because as soon as they walked in the door, I said, here's a laptop. Start learning. Be that voice. Be that person out there. It's OK, unless you look like 3.30. Did 3.30 show up? Then don't be the voice. <laughs> um, if you're scary looking, you might not want to be the voice. Uh, all right. Yes, so there it is. Do I have time for, how, how are we doing? Oh, we have plenty of time. All right. Uh, thank you, and here's my sign. A little redneck joke for you. I'd be happy to take questions, or you guys can bail. What's up, brother? So the question by the amazing Dan Washko of the Linux League Tech Show was, everything is proprietary now and only runs on Windows now. Mac, it runs a lot on Mac now, but it still doesn't run on Linux. How do you get around that if you're trying to promote open source? A lot of times you don't. Um, that's it. Um, now, if it's things like Photoshop, you go, well, you know, it's funny. A GIMP is a guy in the basement with leather on, but it's also a really cool piece of software. You want to check it out, and you hope that they'll be OK with it. It's not the same with Photoshop if you're a Photoshop user. And that's, that's always been a problem. It's not getting better. I can't sugarcoat it. <laughs> um, there are remote desktops. You still have to license them. There are virtual desktops. You still have to license them. But there are ways that you can now virtualize Windows apps and put them on the Linux desktop. Yep. So open curriculum. I'm sorry. So it's more of a curriculum question. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. I'm not seeing that now. There is a huge movement for open curriculum now. Please do. So the gentleman's point is they're, they're teaching Microsoft Word rather than just Word Processor. That's a very problem, the, the whole ambiguous, yeah. That's true. The, the, you're right. So there is, and that's unfortunate. We, we see this grind every day. The, the gentleman's point was, there is a message by using proprietary software and, and platforms for curriculum that that's the me Right, right. So curriculum is an interesting thing. Um, there's a huge push right now in America for open curriculum, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Chip, sure. Sure. Mm. Okay, we're getting into pedagogy now. See, I like pedagogy talk. So, which is a lie. <laughs> um, we're getting into like fascist territory now, but. There is, um, that's, that's a cool concept. The Apple, the Apple iOS is proving that right now. Everybody okay. has iPhones, they expect to go to work, they expect right. to have tablets, and their iOS devices to work. Let me repeat your point so that, so that the camera gets it, and then I will speak to it. Um, your point is that Microsoft and Apple have kind of proven this horrible proprietary grind system that, is, that we're, now we're all a part of. 
Um, I agree, agree complete, completely. Um, what's, going to it, what's going to happen in the world is the way, the way I look at this is eventually those systems always fail because they're corrupt. Um, or at least they're supposed to. It's kind of like our government, actually. Uh, so it will be interesting to see who wins in the long. Um, I completely agree, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying, Dan, is the proprietary grind is something, like, I, I, need to, I need to feed my family, so I have to be a part of it. I don't have to like it. And I, I guess my point is be a part of the community that promotes open source. Make sure you're out there. That's part of the problem. A lot of people don't know open source software even exists, particularly in education. Right. Um, right. All right. It has to be grassroots. Uh, completely agree. Um, and the point I was making uh, on the slide of going to talk to your school board, if you feel there's, there, there's certain people in the world that have to listen to you. School board happens to be one of them. They don't have a choice. You can go there and talk to them, and they have to sit there and nod off. They might not listen, but they have to be there. Um, politicians are the same way. And if you feel strongly enough that your children are not getting a proper education, you should go to your school board and talk to them. And if that has something to do with open source or not open source, then go speak to them. Oh, you want to say something? No. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah, marketing, right. Awesome point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase for the camera what you said. Marketing. That's the, one, that's the one thing that we have. I mean, that's our problem. That's why I'm here, right? That's why I'm saying be a member of the community and be an open voice because you are the open source marketers, people. There is no budget for it. Congratulations. You've been promoted. <laughs> no, we haven't. <laughs> I know it's a bad job, but somebody's got to do it, you know? Cool. So we're an actively academic elitist, and we essentially have the exact same attitude. What's wrong with you people? Why don't you get it? You know, right. This is the right way to do it. Why don't you do it? Well, and, uh, that, and it's also a marketing issue there as well. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Who else? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yes. I remember when Lotus 1, 2, 3, and uh, Corel Draw were be things to learn because Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, point, uh, a great point. Uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, you know, was the same way. It was that thing that you learned in the school, which is, it's the same paradigm, and, it, and we're in a cyclic, uh, a cyclic kind of uh, thing, a grind with proprietary software. That's the way it works. Sir. Absolutely. Yes, yes, that's the point. Yes, gentlemen's point is, and as we were saying before, you don't learn Microsoft Word, you learn about word processing, right? Um, and you and I know, because we're all like massive geeks, you use one program and you use them all. Right. Ooh. Don't ask me that, man. My wife's a teacher, you're gonna get me in trouble. Oh, we're back to pedagogy. The system's broke, brother. The system's broke. That is a pedagogy problem. That's a problem with underfunding in schools, bad teachers, bad curriculum. Sad but true. Uh, sorry, for the camera, point was, gentleman was making, uh, was my, my kid goes to school and watches movies and had music instead of learn to read, write, and do arithmetic.
Okay. Okay, so gentleman's point, I have to comment on this. <laughs> gentleman's point is 50 years ago, you learned something and you could, you could go to work and work for 30 years on that concept. Now with technology, things are moving so fast that you have to constantly be relearning. Agree and disagree. Um, here's the thing. My son's doing his times tables. Those times tables were as handy as when I learned them as he's learning them now. There are some base education foundations. A person, fifth, uh, person 50 years ago who read The Catcher in the Rye, is that up and Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and reads it today, still gets massive amounts of value on it. Technology has nothing to do with it. And we are losing the foundations of education, not the technology in education. And I think, uh, so to kind of, you know, I, I feel like there's actually a bigger problem with, you know, with, with science, math, and, uh, and base literary. Yeah, yeah. There's a very good chance that the job that he has is first You got a job already? No. The very first job he has hasn't been finished yet. Yes, yeah, absolutely, which is a great point, yeah. A uh, gentleman said that there's a very good possibility that the job he has, is going to have, is not even around yet. Yep. But if, if I'm too smart to stay relevant, you know, up to date, and you keep learning from my job, why are teachers not required to do the same thing you do in their job? Okay, we're still, see, this is, uh, this is I don't like insulting uh, teachers too much, but tenure, okay, <laughs> was never supposed to happen. It was never supposed to be in a school district. A, a K-12, their tenure was not built the way it is used. There is a huge problem that when a teacher gets tenure, she can, he or she can then, see, I was, I was already talking about my wife. Did you see that? I'm in trouble, man. No, I'm kidding. My wife's a great teacher. Um, he or she can skate by for the next 25 years. What other job is there that you can do that? If there is one, I'm sure it's failing as well. That is part of the problem, as are unions, but you guys can, I'll probably get stabbed later, but anyway. <laughs> What's that? This is a right to work state, you're okay. Okay, cool. It is, it is in Virginia as well, yeah. But you know, you don't have to have unions to have the exact same corruption in the school system. It's, it's almost exact, even without unions, which is interesting, because of tenure. But anyway, I go off on tenure for hours. Um, sorry for those educators in here that are banking on tenure, but that's just the way I feel. Uh, nobody's giving me a free ride for the rest of my life, so. Uh, <laughs> that sounded so bitter. <laughs> All right, who's next? Are we done? Okay, what, last question then. Yeah. Right. Marketing. So great point, gentleman says, it doesn't matter if you're a coder or not. Go out and support your open source community. Get involved. 3.30 was not here, and I, made, I wanted to make fun of him twice. But now I'll say something good about him. He can't code his way out of a paper bag. But he's on the marketing team for Fedora. Why? Because he has different skills. You can still be part of the community and contribute, regardless of what you do. That is my time. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I like that I prompt you for that clap, that was awesome. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. 
The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. 
lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloudstack.